Okay, so just a bit more detail about pulmonary ventilation, which is breathing. Um, this is moving air from the atmosphere into your body and from into your body back out to the atmosphere. Um, the flow of air into and out of the lungs is governed by three principles. The first one is related to a physics law called Boyle's gas law or Boyle's law. And it says that basically what we were talking about before, if you take a container filled with gas and you smush it, that change in volume can cause a change in pressure. Um, and then changes in pressure, a difference between a pressure at point one and point two, um, will cause changes in flow. And that's really similar to what we learned with blood flow. So basically Boyle's law or Boyle's gas law says as the volume of a closed container increases, the pressure in the container decreases and vice versa. So there's an inverse relationship between volume and pressure. That's Boyle's law or Boyle's gas law. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Take a container of gas, like a balloon, right? It's a container of gas and smush it really hard, assuming that it would not pop and you will increase the pressure inside the balloon. Okay, the second thing is the thing that I keep referring to. The second basic principle in governing air in and out is that air flows like liquids do from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. It's the same basic equation as the blood flow, which is F equals delta P over R, only the delta P is a really specific difference. You always relate atmospheric pressure, the pressure out here, which is usually a relatively constant 760 millimeters of mercury, to the pressure inside your alveoli, which can change depending on the size of the chamber. So this, out here does not change very much, but I can squish this and stretch it and squish it and stretch it. And when I do that, I can pop the pressure above atmospheric pressure, air will move out. I can pop the pressure below atmospheric pressure and air will move in. So the equation for airflow into and out of the lungs equal is F equals the difference between atmospheric pressure and alveolar pressure. And alveolar pressure is the pressure inside your alveoli, right? which we'll talk about how that's related to the pressure of the chamber in just a minute, um, over R. F equals delta P over R. And we'll talk about resistance as well. So just to make sure that you've got the definitions, the atmospheric pressure is usually a constant 760 millimeters of mercury. It will change if you go to the moon, but I don't think you're going today. All other pressures are expressed relative to atmospheric pressure. So let me say that again. Every other pressure is expressed relative to atmospheric pressure. So if at atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, we could say that it was one millimeter of mercury higher than that by saying it was 761, My apologies. 761 millimeters of mercury. Or we could just say it was one because if we set 760 as like the zero point and we compare everything to it, then 761 would be just one and 759 would be negative one. So I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, so um, the P sub ALV is the pressure inside the alveoli. At rest, when air is not moving anywhere at all, Usually they say P sub ALV, the alveolar pressure is zero, meaning it's not at all different from atmospheric pressure. So if the alveolar pressure is zero, air is not moving anywhere. It's like in between breaths. If right now I am forcibly pushing or I'm pushing air out, I know that the pressure in my alveoli is at least 761 because air is moving out. When I'm doing this, I know that the pressure in my alveoli are let is less than 760 because air is moving in. Okay, I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. Okay, and the other key factor, the other thing, uh, the other principle is that the movement of air into and out of the lungs is opposed by resistance. And we'll come back to resistance to figure out what at a given pressure difference will oppose air moving in and out. Being loud. Um, my dog is being extra loud tonight. Um, okay, so um, 
So let's talk about the muscles involved in a little bit more detail. So we talked about these before. I just wanna make sure you get it and then we'll move on. So there are muscles involved in ventilation. The primary muscles involved in ventilation are the diaphragm, which is skeletal muscle. A lot of you guys wrote on your essay question that it was not skeletal muscle. It totally is skeletal muscle. So the diaphragm um, and um, the intercostal muscles. And specifically, you have external intercostals and internal intercostals. And we'll refer back to those in just a second. So um, the deal is that you need a delta P in order for flow to occur, right? Just like with blood flow. And if alveolar pressure is less than atmospheric pressure, right? Atmospheric pressure is higher than air will move in. That's called inspiration. If alveolar pressure is higher than air will move out and that's called expiration. Okay. But um, now let's relate what's happening in the thoracic cavity to actually what's happening inside the alveoli. So the first thing we have to do is to make sure that the lungs move with the thorax. How do you make the lungs move with the thorax? And this is a little bit of a tricky concept, but I don't test over it super hard. So just hold on to the idea. Okay. So we're inside the lungs right here. Okay. And the alveolar pressure is zero in between breaths, meaning it's not any different than atmospheric pressure. Okay. But what you need is between the lung and the chest wall. Really, it is between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. What you need is for those things to be suctioned close to one another, like two wet microscope slides, okay? They need to have some hydrogen bonding from the moisture, and then they need to have some negative pressure. You need to keep them suctioned close to one another. So imagine taking two pieces of plastic wrap that are wet and then sucking all of the air out of them with a straw and they're going to stay adhered to one another. So what we need in order to make sure that the lungs stay stuck to the thoracic wall is we need the pressure inside the pleural fluid. Remember there's fluid in there. It's serous fluid. We need it to be negative. We need to suck the fluid out of there. That happens naturally, developmentally in a healthy person. So keep that intrapleural pressure, the pressure inside the pleural fluid or the serous fluid in the pleural cavity. We need that to be lower than zero, okay? Lower than this, okay? <sighs> suck all of the air out of there, make sure it stays adhered, and then the hydrogen bonding keeps it stuck. And then, if those two microscope slides are stuck together, they're just stretchy microscope slides. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna contract my diaphragm and my external intercostals and I'm gonna pull out the thoracic cavity and what are my lungs gonna do? They're gonna go with it, okay? Lungs are nice and stretchy and healthy lungs and as long as they're stuck, they're gonna go with the thoracic cavity. That concept is called intrapleural pressure. At rest, in a healthy person, the intrapleural pressure should be about minus four millimeters of mercury, which really means 756 millimeters of mercury, four less than atmospheric, um, or sorry, four, yeah, four less than atmospheric and also four less than alveolar. So it keeps it stuck. So as long as the intrapleural pressure is less than the alveolar pressure, then the alveoli will stay stuck to the surface. My and, apologies. Ugh, surface and... Um, so when the thoracic cavity increases in volume during inspiration, um, then the lungs will go with it. Um, but this expansion, this expansion is going to be opposed by the tendency of the elastic lungs to recoil due to their elasticity. And we'll come back to the, they need to be elastic. They need to be stretch out. But then when you let go of them, they should snap back so that they can help push the air back out. Okay. So. Clinical connection related to this is the concept of a pneumothorax, okay? So let's look at the concept of a pneumothorax. So a pneumothorax is what happens when you get atmospheric air pressure into your pleural cavity. Like if something happens that punctures your thoracic cavity and goes through the parietal um, pleura, it doesn't even have to touch the lung. What it will do is it will allow the pressure inside here to equal atmospheric pressure. And so you'll lose your hydrogen bond, they'll pull away from the wall, and because they are elastic, what they will do is collapse. 
So interestingly, a collapsed lung doesn't even have to touch the lung. This is called a pneumothorax. The pleural sac gets broken, the parietal um, pleura, negative pressure is lost, you lose your hydrogen bonding to the wall, your two wet microscope slides pull apart from one another, becomes equal to atmospheric pressure, and the lungs recoil due to their elasticity and they cause the lung to collapse and therefore the alveoli to collapse. Luckily, they're in two separate sacs. So the other one, hopefully on a good day, will stay inflated and stay functional. But of course, your gas exchange is going to reduce dramatically. So what do you do in this situation? Well, you wouldn't let me do it because I generally just deal with dead people. But you would actually use a chest tube with negative pressure that will actually pull out and generate a vacuum again, generate negative four. And as long as these guys are nice and moist, the lung will again expand due to its elasticity and then the moisture will adhere it to the wall and then you plug the hole, okay? So it didn't even necessarily damage the lung, okay? And on a good day, you can repair that. Okay, so um, the next concept is resistance. So we'll cover that in the next video. At the end of expiration, barometric air pressure and alveolar air pressure are equal. Therefore, no movement of air into or out of the lungs takes place. Inspiration begins with contraction of inspiratory muscles to increase thoracic volume. This results in expansion of the lungs and an increase in alveolar volume. The increased alveolar volume causes a decrease in alveolar pressure below barometric air pressure and air flows into the lungs. At the end of inspiration, the thorax and alveoli stop expanding. Air flow into the lungs causes alveolar pressure to become equal to barometric air pressure. Because the pressures become equal, no more movement of air occurs. During expiration, the volume of the thorax decreases as the diaphragm relaxes and the thorax and lungs recoil. This results in a decrease in alveolar volume and an increase in alveolar pressure. Since the alveolar pressure is now greater than barometric air pressure, air flows out of the lungs. Air continues to flow out of the lungs until alveolar pressure becomes equal to barometric pressure.